I'm just going to wait for a few more people to come in. I'm going to give it another couple of minutes if you um, are just joining us. Thank you. I'll just give it another another minute and then I'll get started. Right, I think I'll get started. So thank you very much um, for joining me this afternoon. My name is Lucy Hart um, and I'm going to be talking about um, the last 10 years at Fulham Palace. Um, my title is 10 years and still growing. Um, I mean, of course, Fulham Palace is quite clearly not just 10 years old. <laughs> um, in fact, you know, we have um, over 1300 years of history. Um, however, uh, the Fulham Palace Trust, um, who uh, was formed 10 years ago, and my position was created 10 years ago, my 10 year anniversary was last week. So it's really talking about the work that we've been doing over the last 10 years um, in the garden and um, you know where we're going to take it in the future as well. So a little bit about me um, before I start. Uh, I was, I've been working in horticulture since I was 13. I had a Saturday job, just really needed some cash. Um, so I went and worked at the local nursery and um, it was one of the best things I've ever did because it, it's, it, it made me realise that I really enjoyed working with plants. So I went straight from school at the age of 16 to Horticultural College um, and I was at Merriswood College there. And in those days they did a year out. So I went and worked on another um, specialist propagation nursery. And then um, I went on to do a degree in horticulture. And then I went on to work in various, um, a few gardens um, and also did a bit of landscape maintenance. Um, but then I went on to work at Q, where I did the Q diploma. Um, and then I was at Q for eight years. And then I came to Fulham Palace. So that was in 2011. And um, yeah, it's never been a dull moment. Um, it's been a, a brilliant um part of my career and one that I've hoped to, you know, continue at least another 10 years, maybe more. <laughs> um, so let's see. So um, some of you may know what Fulham Palace is, um, but I wanted to give you um, it from a head gardener's point of view, of course. Um, so Fulham Palace Trust, um, as I say, so we took on the responsibility of running uh, Fulham Palace. Um, 10 years ago. Um, Fulham Palace is the historic home of the Bishop of London and there is uh, Bishop Sarah Mullerly there uh, who is the first female bishop. She doesn't live at the palace. Uh, the last bishop was here in 1972, Bishop Stockford. 
she lives near St Paul's Cathedral but we are um, well connected with her and she comes and gives talks and she comes to uh, our chair par chair's party and I um, met with her and spoke with her um, uh, the other month which is very nice um, and then of course we have our amazing history but we are um, also a a really nice place to just come and have a picnic and to come and visit. We are a garden, we have 13 acres, we're free of charge, open seven days a week, open from sunrise to sunset. And it's really nice, um, nice relaxed environment. We have a museum, um, a brand new museum, which opened in 2019, which is fantastic, telling the story of the Bishop of London and our other, and all our other stories. Um, and the palace itself costs over a million pounds to run each year, about 1.2 million pounds. And we get that, um, we're able to cover that through um, a number of, of ways. One is through, we rent out, um, the, the some of our rooms in the palace itself to private businesses and also you can see the little cottage the pink cottage there um on the left that is one of our private residential um uh, lettings so we have um some of those and that covers about half of our of our income and then um about a third of it is um covered by weddings and private events that, and the cafe, of course, we have a cafe here. And then the rest of it is covered by private donations and our own events that we run and grants that we apply for um, and um, uh, general donations here on site as well. And uh, here you can see that picture of the apples. That was um, from Apple Day, where we have uh, a wonderful sort of celebration of the harvest each October, first week's first Sunday of October. Um, that's one of our events. But this year we did our first green meet, which it was, um, we announced our biodiversity and climate change resilience policy. And we had um, lectures and we had some good uh, discussions and stalls all connected to um, helping the, the the environment um, and increasing biodiversity. Um, and also we have a Christmas fair and our Christmas fair this year is gonna be the second one. It's gonna be bigger than last year, of course, with less COVID restrictions. And that is the last weekend of November, the 26th and 27th of November. So please check, us, check it out on the website. So a brief history of Fulham Palace. Um, there's been a site here since 704. And um, there's been 133 bishops to date. Um, the Bishop of London is the fourth most important figure within the Church of England. So you have the Queen, who is the most important, Archbishop of Canterbury, then Archbishop of York, then Bishop of London. Um, and the last one, as I said, was Bishop Stockford. And by that time, he was living in a wing on the west side of the palace um, because the palace would have been too expensive to run it was run very run down um and in 72 he left um the site and lived in the um near st paul's cathedral and hammersmith and fulham local authority took over in 1975 and that was when it was opened up to the public um as a public garden to come and visit um so the council ran it for uh 40 years or so and um, then 2011 Fulham Palace Trust took, took over and that was when my position was recreated head gardener role and it really was a kickstart to getting the garden back restoring it and getting it back to being um, something really special um, and you know we're still doing it now but um, certainly uh, it, it's been a great um, success we've got we've, we've done some amazing things so garden history, well, we know that there was a garden here in the 1500s and that was established by Bishop Fitzjames. And he can see the Tudor arch in the wall garden where his coat of arms would have been there above, above the gateway there. But it was Bishop Edmund Grindle, um, who slightly later, about 50 years later, he um, 
also showed a great interest in the landscape and the garden. And he introduced the tamarix, that's tamarix gallica from Sweden. And he planted that here. And it's a very beautiful shrub. We have quite a few here planted around the site with this lovely fluffy pink um, blossom in kind of mid spring. He also grew the first grapes of the year and would present them to Queen Elizabeth I. And so we have a good connection with vines. I'll show you our vinery a bit later. Um, and here is the first, the earliest plan that we have of Fulham Palace. And this was um, drawn up by John Roke. It was part of the uh, Roke map series where uh, John Roke was, he did the map of London and he did a map of Paris. And it was really to see which one was bigger. But for us, it is a really important uh, a survey of what the site may have looked like then. And if you can see, there is a black line that goes all the way around. That's actually the moat, which I'll talk about in a minute. But also within the grounds, there are some interesting compartmentalised gardens, which may have been where the gardens were. Um, George London is was very much, who was one of my predecessors, um, he was very much influenced by the Baroque style of gardening. Sadly, none of this is there today, but still very interesting to see what the gardens may have looked like. And this is what we have now. So um, it, we're left with a late 18th and 19th century layout. And in the front, we have the main drive. Then we have the palace itself. Then we have the main lawn. And then we have the wall garden. And then you can see that we almost border the Thames. Um, there is actually a strip of Bishop's Park that comes between us and the Thames. But we have, um, because we're so close to the Thames, we have a very gravelly, sandy soil, uh, river, terrace gravel, it's called. Um, and also, as you can see, the Putney Bridge there, um, there is actually a tidal crossing um, originally there. And this would have been used many um, hundreds of years ago and what it's it was um there was a lot of activity therefore on either side of this tidal crossing on our site which has led to our site becoming an ancient scheduled monument because so there's a lot of special archaeology dating back to roman times all the way up but it was this tidal crossing that really makes it extremely special um, and we've done a few archaeological digs over the last 10 years so the gardening team, um, of course, is a very important part of, of running any anything, but um, we work very closely with with the gardeners, all the gardeners work very closely together, um, and we wouldn't be achieving any of this if it wasn't for the people themselves. Um, so my team is now um, complete, so we've had some new um, recruits recently, which is very exciting. So there's myself, I have two senior gardeners and three apprentices. And also recently we have worked with the Kickstart government funded scheme. So this is about getting people back into work um, after the pandemic. Um, and um, it's been really nice to work with young people, um, working, getting them into horticulture. And Rick, who you see on the right there, he actually now has a full-time horticultural position um, in North London, which we are really proud of him. Um, who have gone on to get such a good job. And then we have Millie in the middle, who's an apprentice. And of course, our garden volunteers. Um, we have a, a fantastic group of garden volunteers. Uh, usually I have about 55 to 60 volunteers who come in once a week. And um, certainly without them, we would um, be nowhere. <laughs> um, they're a really great bunch of hardworking um, souls who, who, who really um, love Fulham Palace and we love them. So thank you so much. Um, we also have volunteer beekeepers um, who look after the bees. And when we have a good year, we'll sell our honey. Um, and we have volunteer green woodworkers. So this is making items out of the green wood that we may have from our tree prunings. Um, these guys are trained um, and they make things uh, that we can sell on our barrow. Um, of course, this is just the garden department. Across the whole of the site, there's over 250 volunteers. Um, and so it's been um, a, a really great considering when we first started, there were, um, there were about 50 volunteers um, and now we've built that up um, uh, very much so. 
And so um, other areas where we are now working um, work, working with, we're getting into gardening with young other young people. Um, we have um we've been working with children disabled children getting them into gardening getting them experiencing being outside in our garden we're working with youth vendors um and we're working with people who don't have uh you know from uh, underprivileged backgrounds who may not have had an opportunity to come and experience gardening or even you know being outside working outside so um we do some weekly sessions, uh, getting people engaged um, and hopefully getting them interested and, in, you know, opening up uh, the, the opportunities for having a career in horticulture. So over the last 10 years, we've done many restorations, big and small. The major restorations are, are listed here. Um, phase one, this was before the trust started, but that was in 2005. And that was really looking at getting the palace watertight, um, getting um, a lot of the, 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 the insides um, restored and the rooms that we see today. Um, phase two was when I just started, when it was nearly finishing. And that was a major restoration, a joint one with Bishop's Park, um, but it was looking at garden buildings and the garden um, uh, garden layout. And also, as I said before, it start, kick-started the garden team. And uh, in 2017, we did phase three, and that was uh, building and um, uh, restoring uh, the palace, the brickwork. Um, we have some, the whole of the Tudor courtyard um, the front part of it has been completely restored and most of the inside the Tudor, of the Tudor courtyard back to uh, original, keeping the original Tudor brickwork, but using the um, techniques they would have done to make the bricks and also with them using lime mortar. Um, but from the garden point of view, um, it was a really fantastic opportunity to link up the palace and the garden more so. So a brand new museum was built within the palace and within that is a, a garden room talking about the special garden collections that Bishop Compton would have would have had when he was here in the late 17th century. Um, and in the garden itself we were able to put in a, a very nice south path and clear an area and actually plant these um, start the collections, the pl planting the botanical collections themselves. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and excitingly, we are even now starting to talk about phase four. So we're at the early stages, um, carrying out feasibility studies um, and uh, proposing a new public garden space. So, so yeah, uh, do um, do do keep an eye out um, for uh, announcements when when these projects are are going to be um, announced and confirmed. So part of the phase two um, was looking at the moat. And um, here you can see in this plan, the moat going round in blue now. And the moat was one mile long. It was the longest moat in England. And um, part of it was dug up by the Vikings, but Alexis, our community archeologist, um, has done a fair bit of research on this. And um, it part of the moat was also already there it was a natural landform so it was um the moat itself had taken advantage of these natural landforms whereas where so being next to the river in some ways the palace itself was a bit of an eight so we have chiswick eight um and these are little islands that are in the thames but the natural landform lent, lent itself to having this moat all the way around it and then um i understand the vikings built dug out one part of it as well, the area that's parallel to the river. Um, and <clears throat> the next picture you can see is, it, this is in the 19th century actually, um, but it, it, the, the, yeah, um, the front of the palace, which we call the paddock, where the main drive is, was um, a farm, it was a homestead, but it was just lovely to see these images with the moat in the foreground. And then slightly later, you can see the bridge um, there with the Gothic Lodge in the background. But in 1920s, this was filled in by the bishop. Um, it was potentially 
probably, it was probably full of sewage and rats. Um, so it got filled in. Um, but it was in 2010 that um, Historic England agreed that it, we could excavate part of it to represent what it would have been like. So there's the building works there. Um, and then over the last 10 years, um, when I arrived to see it, it had been grass, just sown, sown with grass, but it's very steep and um, it's very tricky to, to manage. Um, we've tried everything, actually. I've tried just to keep keep it cut down. So I've tried scything, um, I've tried remote control mower, um, and um, you know we haven't quite tried it, but always talking about perhaps getting a goat or something to keep it grazed. Um, but what we do do, we so we just cut it down once a year, and this cutting and removing annually has been really um, uh, fantastic for bringing in natural wildflowers. And now the site itself within the moat, within the dried moat itself is a really, really um, fantastic, um, uh, it's really, it's, it's got some really fantastic populations of, 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 of naturally occurring native species. Um, and um, so that's really exciting for our biodiversity. And then the last picture there, you can see, because um, it, it is so tough to cut down, we have this fantastic group of volunteers called the Good Gym, who come along on usually on Saturdays, and uh, we always get them to help us cut down the moat, as well as using our own volunteers, of course, um, because the Good Gym are all about doing good things for communities as well as getting fit. And so this is the perfect um, ex uh, a, a task for them um, going up and down the slopes all the time. Um, phase two also was about restoring the vinery. So the black and white photo um, was taken in the 1960s. Um, excuse me. Um, uh, actually, so this was taken in the 80s. In the 60s, it, it, it was still looking intact. But over the over the years, it was really starting to become very dangerous and, and derelict with smashed glass everywhere. Um, so... Uh, and then by the time this, the, the bottom one there was taken in 2009, 2009, and you can see trees growing out of it. So it was taken down. The archaeologists came in and did lots of research and were looking at these arches that they found because it was a vinery. <clears throat> Again, connecting, you know, going back to our connection with vines, it grew um, grapevines in there. But originally it was a pinery vinery, so it would have had grapevines growing on top whilst pineapples um, on, on the ground. Um, and the two kind of worked quite well together somehow um, with the pineapples just taking up the floor space and the vineries up the, and the vines up there. But vines have got quite deep roots and they like, like moisture. So like the one at Hampton Court, this one would have gone out under these um, arches underground and take the advantage of soil moisture outside. So here the archaeologists are doing some investigation um, before rebuilding. And then as part of the rebuild also, we were able to put in a large water tank. So now the current, the, 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 the binary we have now today collects rainwater from that and the connecting bothy buildings on the other side. Um, and we reuse rainwater when watering out in the garden. And this is what it looks like today. Um, so we have an aluminium framed glass house, um, which if you're a plant historian, you would have appreciated more a wooden timber structure, I'm sure. However, it is really, um, we are really able to maintain it a lot easier with it being an aluminium structure. And it's on the exact same footprint as where, what, where it would have been. Um, I don't grow vines in there yet. Um, I use one of the wings for growing glasshouse crops, like tomatoes and cucumbers. It's bang on south facing, so it gets really hot in there, and those crops love it. And then the other side I use for um, grow, for propagation and seedlings. Um, and uh, who knows if we if we're able to one day do such a thing, we may put another glasshouse up where we can continue to look at how we use our binary if I have some more glass house space for other propagation um, and plant growing on and then you'll see these volunteers just as a quick one so this just shows how great the volunteers are here they are hand picking out box um, box caterpillar 
caterpillars from our box hedge. Um, as Londoners will know, box box caterpillar just ravishes box plants now very sadly but we find hand removal very effective and um it's uh yeah it's quite a lot of fun as well um when you're out there uh, you know competing against your fellow volunteers how many you can get um so what else they did in phase two so the garden bothies as i mentioned these are um the, a series of buildings um outhouses on the back of the vinery outside the wall garden um, and they look like this, those two images on the left. But now they are restored and, you know, uh, I, I, when I, uh, we moved into them um, uh, within the first year I was here and we used them. Uh, there are, it's our potting shed, our, our garden office, our um, stores, our mess room. And I really love it because these were the buildings that the gardeners would have used as their headquarters um late 18th century um and so we're kind of using them for what they were originally intended um which is really nice um so as a gardener this is that's me actually about 10 years ago and uh, probably about nine and a half years ago and um so the first thing i did was to plant up the not garden so it was the first thing you saw when you came through the tudor um, the Tudor Gateway in the wall garden. Um, and it's not really a knot garden because a knot garden is where the box hedge itself are kind of inter intertwined, whereas it's actually a parterre um, because it's symmetrical, but we call it a knot garden <laughs> and it's a kind of sticks. But this garden was originally planted by Bishop Blomfeld in the 1830s. So it was really nice to, to replant it. And also um, I used the colours of his coat of arms as the theme, red, yellow and blue. And um, so the picture on the left was in 2012 uh, or 2009. And so, you know, you can just see, so the paths have been put in. Um, but really, the you know, there's the just nothing else in the garden, really, apart from the amazing wisteria. Um, and so just over the years, I've put in borders and we put in a veg garden and an orchard and, um, you know, just been able to really try and put in as many plants as we can. Um, because, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's that's what we want. We want lots more plants. Um, Having said that, I've had to remove quite a few as well. Um, so we we do did have um, we were over overly invaded with sycamore, and um, not not that, not to say there's anything uh, bad again. You know, I think sycamore gets a bad press because it's not like an oak where an oak supports over, you know, well hundreds of species um, of insects. A sycamore does support other insects but it's because they're very invasive and here you can see a picture on the left that it'd been allowed they've been allowed to grow so here's our amazing palace with a load of, with a kind of sycamore forest in front of it so with permission um from historic england with grinding stumps out and permission uh, to remove the trees we remove them or able to replant and actually this is a project i'm going to be working on we're going to be refreshing this border um and uh putting it on another one on the other side as well um that's going to happen over the next few months um and of course you know we love trees uh whether you know we need to take some away sometimes to make room but um and our, our, our very special home oak um uh it which we is over 500 years old. So would have seen many bishops come through Fulham Palace um, and would have been in a, a mature tree by the time Bishop Compton was here collecting plants. Um, but when I arrived, it was, you know, it was just a great climbing tree. Uh, you can't deny it. And there were about 20 children just hanging off all the branches. So I had, I came along and I, you know, sadly I roped the whole thing off to stop people from, not from climbing the tree. We don't have tree climbing at Fulham Palace um, because we have their botanical collections and, um, you know, we want to conserve our botanical collections. But I wrote it off mainly because of the compaction. People walking under trees is going to be pushing out any air for the poor roots to grow and succeed. And um, ultimately, compaction will kill trees. So we wrote it off and... Um, 
each year I look at that home oak and I can see there's lots of new growth coming on um, and I think it's doing all right. I think it's doing well. So that's a really good feeling. So um, before we could really do any major sort of restoration or, or plan in the wall garden, we needed to, we did a, we needed to know, as I said, we didn't have the greatest records plan. So we thought we would find out and see if we could find out um, what was there by doing a garden archaeological dig. So this was where we were looking for garden archaeology. So we weren't going any lower than about 40, 50 centimetres, if that. Roman stuff you'll find at about 90 centimetres deep, you see. So this was a shallow dig looking for bed areas or tree pits. And we did find those we found um, a row of tree clay pits. So they used to put clay into areas where they would have planted trees um, uh, because we need to retain soil moisture. It's actually a very clever idea because the soil in, you know, in, in the garden is very well drained. And also we found some diagonal bed shapes. Um, we found some plant labels. That's what that triangle clay um, uh, silver um, shape is. Um, and anyway, that's what, uh, inspired the the veg garden layout as we see today um having these diagonal diagonal shapes going across so that was really interesting to do um and also i've put in um adjacent to the veg garden i've put in an apple arch and um you can see the painted image here by jesse mcgregor in early 1900s um uh, there was always this sort of long, lovely walk. Um, and this would have been the walk that the bishop would have done every day from the palace to uh, All Saints Church. Um, the, 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 the image where the volunteers are helping me pick apples, that was in 20, um, 2012. And the, the path is very narrow. Um, so that was what was put in just before I started. Um, but I we, it was important to try and make that wider, to make that wider so that we could, you know, have lots of public walking through um, easily. And um, I wanted to put some, an arch in because walking through an arch, um, this kind of gives you a real experience. Um, it makes you feel like you're walking somewhere quite important, walking through something important. And of course, that was a nod to the bishop's walk that he would have done every day. Um, and the next project I'm going to be doing is looking at this wisteria. Um, so this was taken this last spring um, and you can't really see it, but it's supported by some pole, uh, wooden posts and scaffolding poles. And I've always been quite offended by this structure, uh, such a magnificent wisteria, which is potentially about 190 years old. We're still, I'm still looking um, at the records with that, but I think it might be. Um, and it's just quite crudely supported by a scaffold, uh, not doing it any justice. Um, and if you can see in this image here, um, it used to be supported by some nice hoops. If you can see through the wall garden gate there, um, there are metal hoops and so it would have looked beautiful when in flower when you don't have the leaves you would have seen the flowers and these lovely um hoop structures so that's what i'm going to be doing i'm going to be putting uh, 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 uh um not replicating but um putting in some new hoops in the style of this um and we did a big um crowdfunding uh this summer and we raised the money by um from the public and um so i met with the con my contractor today who's going to help me make the hoops and help me put it in and hopefully we should be putting this in in january which is very exciting so now i'm going to talk about bishop compton um and um this is really about the phase three uh, restoration that we did i just have a glass of water So Bishop Compton, who I've already mentioned, um, he really is, um, well, you know, my favourite uh, bishop. Um, he brought horticultural glory and fame to Fulham Palace. He was a mad plant, plant um, collector. 
and he was very passionate about botany. Um, he lived here in 1675 to 1713, where he was Bishop of London. Um, and uh, he, you know, he was a political bishop, um, but it was plants that um, was his real passion. Um, and um, he was responsible, so Bishop of London was responsible for the Church of England overseas. Um, and he used his clergymen um, who worked in the British colonies to send him over plants. Um, he even actually got one of his um, clergymen, or uh, sorry, he even got a botanist ordained um, so that they could go overseas and send back plants. That was how, um, that was his priorities, <laughs> um, which was brilliant for us because um, it, it was really a pioneering plant collector at that time. And of course, um, importing and exporting shipping was becoming um, really popular. And so it was a, a good time for him to really take advantage of that and to be able to bring in all these exotics over a thousand of them he was supposedly to have grown so um in 1975 he he came to fulham palace and straight away he took on uh george london um who i mentioned before um who and um and george london um actually was um famous after fulham palace um for um for setting up the Brompton Park Nursery in 1681 um, with his business partner, Henry Wise. Um, but George London worked over worked, worked all over in, in many other gardens and he was connected to Hampton Court as well. And he uh, would have worked closely with, with Bishop Compton in planting um, all the wonderful specimens out. He also brought over the hedgehog holly from France. So that's pictured there and I've tried to propagate that it's very difficult so um I need to try that again actually um from some material I got from Q and here you can see uh Compton um sorry George London even started to set up his own plant classification system so this was pre-Linnaean so Linnaeus he uh um he brought plant plant he 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 introduced plant classifications uh, to us and what we use today, um, you know, what we very much relate to. Um, so this is all pre-Linnaean. Um, and although George London's never, one never took off, it was still, um, you know, very interesting to see. And here are some uh, flower collections that he, he pressed himself um, in his own um, herbarium pressing, which I'll talk to you about now. Um, in a minute, I mean, <laughs> um, but John Bannister, um, uh, he was one of Compton's most enthusiastic clergymen. He was based in Virginia, he's British, but based in Virginia, and he was a, a botanist, and he would send many, many, many plants back to, to, to Bishop Compton, more than any of the other um, clergymen. And so the collection itself is dominated by North American species, particularly from Virginia, although there were specimens, species that came, over, came from all over, um, pelagoniums, for example, from South Africa. But here are some examples of, of species that Bannister sent over. So we have Critagus criscali with a beautiful large um, hawthorn, North American hawthorn with very large berries, Tri a Trillium cecily, um, Dicentra, uh, Dutchman's breeches, that one's very pretty, Gelenia trifoliata, which um, is uh, has a lovely autumn colour and um, it's used quite widely in uh, cultivation in uh, herbaceous borders these days, and sassafras albadum um, and liquid amber um, starus fluor, which is coming into its own, all these wonderful autumn colours. Um, so liquid amber is, is actually used as um, a very popular as a street tree. Um, it's a really nice street tree, uh, very common in, in London. And these were all sent over from John Bannister um, in, in, you know, the, well, six, from 1678. Um, but the project, so we were able to, to learn l l about all of this because, I mean, since the 70s, people have been talking about Bishop Compton's plant collections and the idea that we should be growing these at Fulham Palace um, and representing this amazing plant collection that he had so early, earlier, you know, earlier, way before Kew, for example. Um, 
But it wasn't until um, 2017 um, when we appointed Dr. Mark Spencer, legend, um, to really research this um, so we could get some really accurate, comprehensive material um, to work and to, to work from and to really get a plant collection going. And um, Mark Spencer used to be the curator of that Sloan Herbarium in the Natural History Museum. And that's a collection of many like hundreds of um, volumes of plant pressings um, that were collected by, by, by um, Sir Hans Sloan. And these collections um, have never been digitized, never been catalogued, let alone digitized. So it was an opportunity for Mark to be able to look through them and really draw out some interesting information, as well as going through some um, uh, literature. Um, here we have the Historia Plantarium, um, which um, he, as well as lots of other literature, he was able to really draw out lots of um, info from. And really excitingly, he found some amazing things. So these are this is some, 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 some examples of plant pressings um, that were taken from the Bishop's Garden at Fulham between 1675 and 1713 um, by uh, botanists. There were some very famous botanists. Uh, they would go around collecting these plant specimens and pressing them. Um, and uh, so these, these are still there in the volume. So he's got primary source material looking at the plants of what was collected at Fulham Palace in, at back, back then. And so that was proof that these actually grew at Fulham Palace. And from, from going through the records, he was able to build up um, a really great spreadsheet of what was there and what wasn't, because um, we'd never done this research before properly. So we've got tulip tree, we've got lavender, we've got, um, we've got um, Jelena there, we've got the liquid amber there. Um, and even a, a pelagonium there in the middle. Um, and this is a nice uh, um, slide because we can actually see in that text, second paragraph, it, um, the, not, they don't all have this description you see, but this one, it grows very tall in the Bishop of London's garden at Fulham. Um, and this is a Rondo Donax, um, which is a really amazing grass. It's huge, goes really tall in one year and then it dies down every year like a herbaceous plant. And then it came that uh, Oxford University came across some original Fulham Palace collections as well. This was very much by chance, I believe. They just came across them because Bishop Compton, um, he was Bishop of Oxford before he came to Fulham Palace as Bishop of London. So he had strong links there. But they found quite a few specimens. Um, and we have these displayed in our uh, museum um, at the moment. We're actually on our second year. We've, we've taken four um, back recently and then we've got four more. And then um, only the other day, Mark said that um, they found another 20 um, so what he thought was he'd done his research work, um, it's been added to all the time. Um, and um, it, what's been was really great for me. So this research that he'd done, um, I was then able to take this spreadsheet, check what what was on there, what had actually been growing here. We could some are very, very large trees, which we wouldn't have been able to have planted. Um, but some were some, you know, really fantastic, um, interesting shrubs and herbaceous plants and bulbs. Um, and it was really nice. So I took out my uh, apprentices and we went to Kew and we went to Charity Physic Garden to collect cuttings, just as what would have been done back then. There was a lot of material constantly being swapped. Um, and here's Nell, the head gardener, and I collecting these cuttings. That's actually from... Um, Janista canariensis, and I've got that, those cuttings now. This is a um, coming onto a six foot uh, shrub now, which is growing out in the collection, which is really exciting. Um, and of course, you know, these plants being sent over, a lot of these were being sent over and being grown at Fulham Palace for the first time. So we've got lots of introductions um, to this to, 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 to this country. So Bishop Compton introduced Crotagrus coccinia, um, Lindira benzoin, Rhododendron viscosum, Cornus amomum. Um, there are about 40 in total. 
um, Aurelia spinosa, which is the devil's walking sticks, fantastic architectural plant. Um, and this adiatum pedatum is gorgeous as well. That's kind of like, there's a lovely, beautiful fern ground cover. And Ace in Agondo with its amazing um, autumn color there. All sent over to Fulham Palace and grown at Fulham Palace for the first time in the UK. And the most exciting one really is, of course, uh, the magnolia, because this wasn't only the first um, magnolia virginiana to be sent over and grown in the UK. It was the first magnolia in the whole of Europe. And I was able to um, source uh, a specimen magnolia virginiana tree because it's the grandiflora that really is the most common um, magnolia that we grow in our gardens. So to get the... Um, uh, sorry, the, the most common American magnolia. Um, so to be able to get the Virginia, I was really ex excited. And here we all are. Um, we planted it together, myself, the garden team of volunteers, uh, and it's doing all right. It's quite tricky because it likes, um, it, I've seen it grown in North Carolina in pure sand in the wild, um, but it likes it wet. So it's quite fussy, but so far so good. Um, and then just, you know, obviously we're, I'm doing all this, but and then Mark, you know, as I say, still finding things. Um, and this is an interesting species, the Apios Americana. This um, has a very pretty flower, but actually it uh, uh, has a tuberous root that you can eat, dig it up a bit like a potato. And Campsis radigan, radicans, the trumpet vine, on, the orange one on the left there, is just such a beautiful climbing plant. I was thrilled that that was a Compton plant and I could get that growing. I've got a whole wall of it um, growing on the um, the back wall facing out, out to the church yard. So this is Canadensis. Um, Mark noted that he, he read about Compton um, using the petals from Circus Canadensis in, in his salad. Um, so he was very um, adventurous uh, with eating and, uh, and just trying things out. Um, and it, really exciting. We This was a specimen, a uh, herbarium specimen sample that we um, borrowed from Oxford um, University Herbaria. And that was as a tomato. So Compton was growing tomatoes um, in the late 17th century. And back then they weren't eating them because they didn't know they were edible, but we bet Compton was. Um, so how we did it um, uh, really was, you know, when you think about it, how it looked, because on the on the, the, the top left um, picture there, it was just very overgrown, this whole bed of ivy and tree stumps. Um, and moving across the top, so I did have to take some trees out, and all of these trees were, we really thought about what we were doing, we didn't take this decision lightly, and I was giving tours every um, every month or so to the public and to our stakeholders, explaining about why we needed to clear this area for the Compton collections, um, but it was really interesting once we'd cut the trees, some the trees then we were able to count the tree rings and just work out perhaps where why had that tree been allowed to grow some of it was when the moat had got filled in um 100 years ago the sycamores were able to come in then some of them weren't that old some were about 40 years ago when the bishop of london left for example um so we cleared the site um and um and then the contractors came in and put the the, the fantastic south path so making it accessible um around the, the side there because before it was just like a, a an overgrown kind of um ivy track <laughs> and i didn't you know these trees that we cut down we didn't let them go to waste um i kept the trunks and we used them um to make a natural play area i did that uh, then the following year um, so I got the tree guys to move the trunks down and then I got these guys in because um, I'd been to the one at Box Hill, was impressed by their natural play area and got in contact with them and they came um, and uh, did ours for us. So, And it's really popular with children and it just gives another element and something else to do here at Fulham Palace and takes the, the focus of climbing the botanical collection. You can come and climb um, the natural play area. Um, of course, we replaced trees, we planted them, we replanted elms, and here we are planting the, the magnolia, which was a lot of fun. Um, and this is pretty much what it looks like 
um, at the moment, um, or a few weeks ago at least, and it's still growing. Um, these are some new additions. You know, we put some, oh, the Amaryllis belladonna, that's a gorgeous bulb. Uh, that's a Compton plant that Mark found out um, uh, uh, fairly recently. And some of these I've sourced already and we've taken cuttings of, but um, it's continually um, being added to. So what's next for this collection? Well, I am I applied for plant heritage status. Um, uh, it'll be hist an historic collection. So um, they have a Queen Mary's one at Hampton Court. So that's their look at they've, they've got all the plants that she grew there at Hampton Court. So this would be the Compton collection. And a couple of years ago, they said, uh, let's let's have it grow for a couple of years. So that's happened now, and it's all doing well. So I'll be I'm going to be going back to them and seeing where we take this. Hopefully, get the it formally um, uh, recognised. And then this image here, of course, I was um, I was supposed to be going to Virginia to go and follow the footsteps of John Bannister, what he did when he was out there collecting plants, sending it back to Compton. But of course that thing, the, the pandemic um, got in the way and um, it's got put on hold um, and my RHS funding, um, uh, will I will be reapplying for that um, once things settle down. And I think the borders are opening, aren't they, of the states, or well, they have done. So we'll see, we'll see when that, when I'm able to get back out there. Um, but let's see how we're doing for time. So just going through then the garden at Fulham Palace, what we've got now. Um, so of course we've got, uh, the vegetable garden in the um in the wall garden These are things that you know we grow every year um all organically grown inside and outside we have a great range of cucumbers um and it's the apprentices that look after the veg garden um with help from you know all of us really it's the team we use we use um all we don't use pesticides at Fulham palace uh and uh, we use insects to 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 predate other insects. Um, and we even have them hanging on bags outside. And this is these bags I often get asked about, we, we suffer with rose apple aphid. Um, so I buy lacewing larvae, um, which is a native insect. Um, I buy them, put them out, and then they crawl out and they hunt out the aphids, do all the hard work for us in March, from March time. Um, and we grow, we sell um, our, all our produce on site. Um, and this is a very much uh, a part of our income, um, our barrow. And we, because of the pandemic, we actually got a, it speed us, speed us, speeded us up to get a, a card reader, which has really helped sales that we found. Um, compost is really important. Um, it was the first thing that I did really when I got to Fulham Palace it used to look like that the top image there but in 2013 I made this uh, unit here so we we're able to uh, control what goes in and turn it um, and it's a brilliant thing you have garden waste and you need somewhere to put it you put it somewhere it comes out and then it comes out as lovely mulch and you reuse it so without it we would be lost. Um, we have a woodland where we do small woodland management it's very small scale but we coppice our hazel to allow whoops to allow um change of habitat which can in invite more insects and creatures and wildlife and then we use the, the the hazel itself to make plant supports um all um all organic all all um uh, uh natural um and uh, doesn't cost us a thing, which is great. <laughs> and the boat moat, which I talked about, of course, these wonderful wildflower populations. Um, here they are, looking really great. We have um, some, Mark surveyed it in 2020, the moat, and found some really interesting species not planted i haven't sown anything in there apart from a uh, yellow rattle i'll show you that in the next slide but all these lovely spikes that's um verbascum nigrum um and uh we have a, a quite a rare calamint um growing there which we've taken seeds of this year we'll be trying to sow some more and when it's really dry you can see in the top right the the white um uh achillea uh, millifolium 
it really comes into its own then and all these flat this flowering we like to leave long grass areas and leave any flowers that we have in the lawn to um, support insects and wildlife during the summer we have um, wildflower meadows which we have sown so there's the yellow rattle on the top right there and that is a hemiparasitic plant which parasitizes grasses to keep the vigor low um, but we also add plugs for wildlife um, wildflower plugs um, as well as sowing wildflower seed and um, any plantings that we do now i will always only choose um, pollinating pollinator friendly specimens and we did a big bulb plant in 2019 which really ups, uplifts the, the back area behind the wall garden um, in spring um, and uh, this year we've had this whole site surveyed um, for birds and butterflies and we were really excited to find these uh, red admiral butterfly uh, caterpillars on all the on all the nettles that we've left um, which is their favorite food and then of course you know it's all fantastic and it's it, it has been great but um i thought i would give you an insight to head gardeners headaches just some of the things that don't quite go to plan um because that's life isn't it um <laughs> but of course well the pandemic can't not mention it um sadly we we closed for three months and we didn't have volunteers for three months um we reopened in june 20 2020 um, and I think we're suffering from from that break of, of having help from the volunteers because we have a lot of weeds now. I think it's, it's, it's within lots of gardens, lots of my gardening friends are also saying the same thing. So we'll get through it. We'll get there. But that, that was a shame. But we're, you know, we're really pleased that we're able, we're, we're, we're open. Uh, we didn't close again throughout any of the other lockdowns. And um We've got lots of things in place to to support uh, our volunteers, and of course, we're working outside, which is very, we're very lucky to do that. Um, garden pests are always annoying. Um, I put this one here. Of course, we've got Edmund, our cat. He, um, I put him in there because we we we've got a mouse problem, uh, and the mice don't even just eat the seeds they wait for us to have sown them and then they eat the seeds or they wait for the seeds to germinate and then they eat the seedlings and it's just heartbreaking so we've got a new cat now as well both of them are working alongside each other to keep the mice down um it's kind of working which is good but we have parakeets being a london garden we have squirrels and they eat our bulbs they eat our apples and uh, there's not much we can do um except you know try uh we we're a feeding ground for the parakeets you see rather than a breeding ground but so it's 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 annoying um another thing is that uh we planted an orchard in 2014 and um uh i think that um seven years on it's um it's not grown as big as I would have liked it to. Uh, it should be about three meters high now, and you can see Annetta, um, that they're, they're dwarf root stocks. And I think I'm sure of it that I've been supplied the wrong the trees on the wrong root stock. A root stock governs the um, height and habit of an apple tree. So I'm going to start replanting them this year. So we could have had an amazing orchard by now. Instead, we've got a very small one and we're going to start again. So that's again what happens. But it's a good education for everybody, for all the apprentices about rootstocks. Can't deny that. Um, Poorly trees, um, it's very sad to see when a tree is not well. The walnut on the left here, you can see the guys are in there taking out the dead wood. I think it's suffering from drought and compaction. Drought and compaction is really going to be a problem throughout um, over the next few years, drought in particular for all our trees. Um, but the Blenheim orange, I couldn't quite bring myself to take a picture of the whole thing. So the veg garden's in the forefront, but that just died. Um, it's got some amazing bungus around it now at the moment. It's still standing dead, but um, it's heartbreaking. Um, but what you can do is you can replant or use it for dead wood and um, try and make a positive out of that. And, you know, there's not, often not much you can do about trees dying. Um, uh, but, you know, plan plan forward for getting um, new species in. 
But having said all that, um, it is still uh, an amazing place to work um, with great people and great plants and great history. And so um, wherever you do, there's always going to be a few issues, but just generally, um, it's been fantastic. So um, thanks very much for, for listening and for your time. And um, I'm just going to check if there are any questions. I don't know um, if if we are if anyone's posted any um no i don't think we've got any questions so thank you very much and um i hope to see you around in the gardens very soon thank you